morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where we have another Warner Brothers centric episode. Uh, yes, Disney better watch it. Uh, more and more uh, studios are encroaching on their domination. Uh, but the first story is actually about the Batman v Superman toys, which will be debuting from Mattel at Comic-Con this year. Uh, but before we dive into that, I just want to give you a reminder that today is your last day to get in those tweets if you'd like to win a ticket to the Rogue Cut screening of X-Men Days of Future Past uh, at this year's Comic-Con. Again, you have to already be attending Comic-Con, uh, but if you tweet me, at Grace Randolph, uh, why Rogue is such an awesome character, and you include the hashtag Rogue Cut, I'll pick the top 20, uh, you know, uh, reasons for why she's so awesome to get a guaranteed uh, admission ticket into the screening, as long as you show up before the screening starts. All right, so again, uh, today's the last day to do that, and I will announce the winners tomorrow on the show. Uh, so let's get to these toys. Where does he get those wonderful toys? All right, Mattel, that's the answer that Mattel, they're like, we paid for that answer. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, the big thing that made the rounds yesterday, which everybody paid attention to, we'll go through the whole toy lineup, but of course was the, uh, the Mattel's Barbie version of Wonder Woman, right? Everybody was like, I think there was like, I think there's a mixed reaction to this, and I think that it's going to mimic the mixed reaction that people are going to have about this character in general, uh, as I think Warner Brothers tries to, tries to launch the first truly successful and embraced female superhero character on the big screen. Everybody loves Black Widow, uh, of course. Well, actually, that's not true, as many of you like to remind me. Black Widow has a very strong fan base that, you know, really supports her and wants to see not only a Black Widow movie, but how about some Black Widow merchandise in the meantime? But there are others who are like, what does Black Widow really contribute to the team? She's not a main member of the team. Let's not get carried away here, right? So I think that Warner Brothers obviously not only wants but needs Wonder Woman to stand, you know, alongside Batman and Superman because she's part of the DC Trinity, but also because she has to support her own movie, right? Although I still believe that Steve Trevor is a vital, uh, you know, piece of that puzzle, uh, the Wonder Woman movie for 2017. We thought it was going to be Chris Pine. There's a rumor that was just deep cover as he discusses the role of Hal Jordan, and that might be announced at Comic-Con next week, uh, but we'll see. I think he'd actually make a better Steve Trevor, but uh, I can see how he would see that as a thankless role in comparison to being Hal Jordan, although I think they're both thankless. But anyway, let's take a look at this Barbie. I think that the Barbie, this is, so what's the problem, right? Well, on the one hand, Right front and center, a lot of attention for uh, the character, right? Like, oh, there's not, it's not like there's no uh, Black Widow merchandise. There's a doll, a Barbie doll, right? And I think it looks very true to form as to the costume. We went over that costume with a fine-tooth comb uh, just recently with the uh, photo that was on display at the licensing expo from Warner Brothers, the photos that were, that were posted online. Uh, and this is a very accurate representation, down to the slits and the boots. So if you like the way Wonder Woman looks on screen, this Barbie is going to faithfully represent that. Although, she has much better hair than we've seen so far. That is some awesome hair. And I still believe that it's important for Wonder Woman to have great hair. Some of you might not agree, but I'm telling you, if she's going to appeal to women, she needs to have great hair. And herein lies the problem, right? Because when people are like, I want Black Widow merchandise, they're not like, I want a Black Widow Barbie doll, right? They'll, they want a Black Widow action figure, they want her included in the toy sets, you know, the, the, you know, the action figure sets with the plane. For instance, there was a big problem when the South Korea segment, uh, you know, when, when brought to life via toy, had Captain America on the motorcycle and not Black Widow. That was a big problem for a number of fans, myself included. I thought that was really unfair. As many people said, you've taken her out of her own actual scene in the movie. So here, with these toys, there is a Wonder Woman toy, but it's only a Barbie, an emphasis on only. There's no Wonder Woman action figure being released at the convention. So I think that for, like, the hardcore female comic book fans, that's kind of frustrating, right? But here's the situation that uh, is facing Warner Brothers, and I think us comic book fans as a group. The answer here might very well be that in order for a female comic book character to reach the heights of popularity of the male characters, she's going to need to appeal to the female viewers out there who aren't so into comics, right? I think one of the reasons the Supergirl show that's coming up is so popular is because, and everyone said, that's like the joke they made on SNL about a potential Black Widow movie. It's here for real. That's what they actually did with the Supergirl TV show. But it's like, but people are into the Supergirl TV show. People like it. It was a joke on SNL, 
but it's succeeding as an actual show. Uh, and then Harley Quinn uh, is, is very popular in the comics and on uh, her upcoming, uh, and any, basically anywhere Harley Quinn goes, she's popular, but that's a very male-centric character who's defined largely by her male relationships, and she's extremely feminine. And for the upcoming Suicide Squad movie, they basically turned her into a Bratz doll, and, you know, she's getting a lot of attention. So I think it's fascinating to, you know, while uh, people feel that, oh, you know, these female comic book characters are like a new, you know, step forward in women's rights and women's equal representation in movies and in life and super heroics, it's like, well, to get everybody on board, they might have to be a little more multifaceted than that, right? They might have to have some of the softer, more feminine aspects that appeal to that broader demographic. So I think you're seeing that happen already with Wonder Woman, and I think it's fascinating. I'd be very curious to see how well this Barbie doll sells, who buys it, uh, you know, and can a non-comic book fan base and a comic book fan base share a character, which I think is really going to need to happen in particular with the female characters. So I would have liked th there to be a more of a compromise, how I would have liked to have seen this gone down, is yeah, have the Barbie. Try to win over, you know, have people bring this home for their daughter and give them like a year to get acquainted with the character almost before Gal, Gal Gadot shows up on the big screen, right? Be like, don't you love playing with your Wonder Woman Barbie? Well, she came to life. But also I would have liked to have seen a Wonder Woman action figure as well. Something for everyone. And I think that's how the female characters are going to best succeed uh, when, you you, when you recognize and reward both fan bases. They might just have to acknowledge there's a split and it's going to require a split in terms of the ad campaigns and also the merchandising. So I'm curious, uh, you know, what do you think of that and uh, what do you think of the, do you want a Wonder Woman Barbie doll and how do you feel about the fact that maybe that, that is the way to go with the character for many people. Now what are the other toys? Alright, well we've got this action figure set uh, they have them out of the case in a moment. Uh, I'll show you the, the picture there. Uh, you can see maybe there's some kind of sound thing because you can see that there's like some holes on the bottom right. Uh, you know, and it makes me feel like it's so you can hear them do something. Oh yeah, it says lights and sound package. It's a lights and sound package. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, you see uh, the bat signal in the sky and then the Superman signal is glowing red like from his heat vision. And I think that's pretty cool. I like that they're really portraying them as powerhouses. I think that's awesome. Uh, I think it's also going to be necessary for a movie that really is basically sold on a fight, right? And I like that in the way they're positioned in the package, that Superman is flying and, you know, Batman's on the ground ready for action. But it gets really hilarious in just a moment, all right? Uh, you know, they had so long to perfect these toys. Look how they look when you take them out of the package. It's absolutely hilarious. Not the Superman, he looks fine, but look at Batman. Look at Ben Affleck's Batman. I mean, it's nice that this comes with some batarangs, right? Uh, although, I don't know how Superman's not going to just catch them or melt them in midair, but we'll see. But look at the cowl on Batman's face. And he's clearly giving Superman the old bat stink eye, right? I mean, that's hilarious. He's just like bugging out. He's like, I freaking hate you. Like, it's so super intense. It's hilarious. I mean, imagine like a little kid, like, you know, like, I understand you wanting to go for some realism and, you know, a lot of adults buy this as well, but like that toy looks like if a toy was going to come to life and punch you in the face, it would be that action figure. But I guess, you know, maybe that's what this Batman's all about, right? Uh, but it doesn't even look like it fits on his head. You know, so we talked about the fact that the first really official, not official, it was leaked, but the first like photo of Ben Affleck in his Batman suit, we all said he looked super uncomfortable. You know, like a little kid who was being put in his winter coat and didn't want to go outside wearing it. He's like, well, this sucks. And I think it's funny that even the action figure looks uncomfortable. So I just think that's a really funny theme to carry out with the character. But you know, he's got the old Frank Miller bat symbol on his chest. Uh, they have the distressing of the costume there. So I think these are pretty faithful toys, but that looks, it looks like, I have to say, it looks like a fan-made action figure where they got another action figure and then like and that's actually somewhat insulting to fan-made action figures because they do a better job but like someone wrapped a bunch of like putty on the, on the on the head to make a cowl and painted on those eyes that's what it looks like it's really hilarious and then also you've got some really cool i believe these are yeah hot wheels hot wheels versions of the batmobile and then because superman doesn't have a car a really cool superman batman kind of car right so uh, I think that uh, that's really hilarious, right? They're like, and then they became friends and they made a car to go around together. I mean, talk about super friends. So those are the Mattel action uh, toys that are being sold at Comic-Con for Batman v Superman. I'm curious, is there anything here you see that you want to pick up? Uh, and what do you think of the discrepancy in the way the, t the characters are being, uh, the way, I think that says, 
Does that say adult collection on the top there? That's hilarious. I, that's really funny if it does. That's really funny. I'd be like, kids, don't even think about buying this. It's too weird. Uh, but anyway, uh, what do you think of the discrepancy between the way Wonder Woman is marketed and the way Batman and Superman are marketed? All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second story of the day is about Warner Brothers live action fairy tales. Warner Brothers, of course, is trying to move very strongly into this marketplace. Uh, they have Pan coming out uh, from Joe Wright, starring Hugh Jackman, Garrett Hedlund, uh, Rooney Mara. We'll get to that in a moment. They also have The Jungle Book with Andy Serkis making his directorial debut. And now they're putting together Pinocchio. Uh, and Robert Downey Jr. has been working on this for a long time. What? Robert Downey Jr.? Isn't he Disney's guy? Well, he's kind of splits his time. He's got like divorced parents, right? He makes his Disney movies, mostly Marvel. But then when he's not doing his Marvel work, he's largely at Warner Brothers. The judge was there, although I'm sure they were like, thanks for that, Robert Downey Jr. But he made his Sherlock Holmes movies there as well. So he has a good relationship with Warner Brothers. And I think it's interesting, though, that he would make his live action fairy tale for a competing studio because, you know, of course, Disney is pretty solidly in that business. But anyway, what really shocked everybody yesterday was the reveal that Paul Thomas Anderson is reworking the script for Pinocchio and that he will likely direct it if everybody is on board and on the same page once they've discussed the script that he's written. And it's like, what? Paul Thomas Anderson is making a live action fairy tale? But I have to say, I applaud Paul Thomas Anderson for his willingness to evolve as a filmmaker uh, in the, from a business point of view, considering that his last two artistic films didn't really gel, right? I mean, The Master and Inherent Vice didn't make a lot of money, didn't get a lot of attention from audiences, and weren't big awards contenders. So he seems to have hit a, hit a, hit a dead end with his, you know, awards you know, work. So I think to reinvent himself, perhaps in a more mainstream fashion, might be a very good idea. I mean, he hasn't had like a film that really captured the public's imagination, or at least, you know, the media's imagination since There Will Be Blood, which I actually really love as a film, and feel was robbed for the Best Picture Oscar from No Country for Old Men. I was like, what? That was ridiculous. Uh, it's kind of like in Glorious Bastards not winning instead of, you know, instead of the Hurt Locker won. I mean, those were times where I was like, what are you on, Academy? But anyway, I think that uh, he needs to do something, obviously, with his career, and this might be the answer. Now, he's also a pretty interesting choice if you think back to Boogie Nights, right? Paul Thomas Anderson's, you know, his really, the film that put him on the map, also put Mark Wahlberg on the map, really helped a lot of people's careers. But, you know, he has to do the whole Pleasure Island sequence in Pinocchio, uh, and I think that, of course, while he's not going to go to the Boogie Nights extent in terms of nudity and explicitness, I think that, you know, Mark Wahlberg's character was very much on a journey, right? Trying to find himself, entering this strange world. And that, there are similarities there with the Pinocchio character. Uh, so I think that ends, adds some credibility to Paul, what Paul Thomas Anderson's Pinocchio might be. And I think it shows that maybe Paul Thomas Anderson's Pinocchio would be very heavy on, like, metaphors and, a, you know, st a stand in for something else. Uh, Robert Downey Jr., by the way, will not be playing Pinocchio. Uh, he won't be playing that evil cat either that takes him to Pleasure Island. He will play Geppetto. So you could expect a considerably bulked up role for Geppetto. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if he'd be like a really smart alecky Geppetto. Uh, but you know, Robert Downey Jr. has done some very nice work from an, from an acting point of view earlier on in his career. And it would be interesting to see if he were to return to that with a live action fairy tale. Now here's the big question. Is this the place to return to sophistication and understatedness uh, with today's tastes and what people want in their live action fairy tales, right? Where is Disney finding the most success? Um, it's with, you know, glitz and glitter. Uh, I think there's a debate, a push and pull as to whether or not people want uh, reinvention of their fairy tales or added layers or just a straight adaptation because while Cinderella was very well received, Maleficent I believe still at the end of the day, I haven't checked the box office numbers recently, but Maleficent still pulled in more cash. So, but nevertheless, they are very similar and they're glitz and glitter, right? So I think that Warner Brothers is betting on more muted and sophisticated live action fairy tales, like the, your favorite books brought to life and you know, you're very going to be very aware that they were books. Uh, or you know, they want the candy coated uh, option that Disney is presenting. And I think so far, the candy coating is winning, as candy coating usually does. So I hope that if they do, I think Pan, by the way, looks fantastic, but I do feel that Pan, we'll talk about it more when Pan's coming out, uh, 
naturally. But I do feel it's a shame that Pan is largely going to be pretty much torpedoed because of the casting choice to put Rooney Mara, a white actress, in a role that is for a, you know, a, a, an actress of color, you know, preferably Native American. Uh, and I think, you know, Warner Brothers has tried to defend that choice, saying, oh, we wanted to take ethnicity out of it, which is why we specifically cast a white actress. And you're like, really? Is that really your defense? And I think they also tried to float out the, we picked the best actress for the role defense. But it's like, what? What if we were doing like, um, you know, I think that wouldn't float in the opposite direction, right? If you're like, I want to tell a story about, uh, you know, a famous white character. I, I don't, I don't want to do a historical figure because obviously Tiger Lily isn't a historical figure. But I think it's funny that the best actor for the job only works when you're tra when you're whitewashing, right? No one ever uses that for the opposite. Although I think maybe they did for Michael B. Jordan with Johnny Storm. And it'll be interesting to see how that's received. But anyway, I'm curious. What do you like in your live action fairy tales? The candy coating, uh, or the more sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, artistic sense, or maybe a mix would be the ideal, right? Uh, art candy coating with an artistic center. All right. So that's the second story of the day. Now the third story of the day. Uh, now I'm going to be traveling. So there'll be no movie math. I'm posting this week's movie math later today. I apologize for the delay. There will be programming going up while I'm away, which is why this week's been so crazy, because I'm prepping two weeks at once. But since there'll be no movie math until July 20th, I wanted to just give you a little box office update today. And I'll give you one again tomorrow. But anyway, uh, obviously, on uh, Tuesday night, uh, Magic Mike XXL and Terminator Genesis both hit theaters for their early evening showings. Uh, and fascinatingly, Magic Mike XXL edged out Terminator Genesis, which you wouldn't expect. You would think Terminator Genesis would have the Tuesday night crowd and Magic Mike would uh, excel during like the weekend, right? When, you know, more traditional moviegoers would go instead of like your hardcore moviegoers. But anyway, people showed up for Magic Mike XXL. It was a very close call though, 2.4 million for Magic Mike. 2.3 for Terminator Genesis. So it's going to be neck and neck all weekend. Uh, and I'll also try and tweet as well while I'm away uh, just to, you know, to, to keep a toe in the movie waters. Uh, but it'll be interesting. Uh, Hollywood expects one of these two movies to beat Jurassic World for the number one spot finally. So I'm curious, and I'm, who do you, if you want to place your bets now, which movie will be the one to, to have the headline that they unseated Jurassic World? I'm actually going to bet... I'm going to bet Magic Mike XXL. I'm going to let it ride on Channing Tatum. Although in the movie, Channing Tatum rides many, uh, you know, lucky female uh, extras. But anyway, I couldn't resist. But anyway, I think that Magic Mike XXL is going to probably edge out Terminator Genesis uh, because I think the word on top, the word of mouth on Terminator Genesis is going to be so toxic, it will affect it in its very first weekend. Uh, I posted in my review yesterday, and while some of you, you know, Arnold is lucky to have such faithful fans, uh, but you know, I didn't. Some of people said, "Oh, you only gave it a bad review because of Arnold Schwarzenegger." Not true. I was hoping to see a good Terminator movie. It's just an absolutely horrible film. Uh, and as many of you have been tweeting me, you wish that you'd listen to me. So uh, it'll be. I'll be curious to see how the film does perform at the box office, but I do think that it's going to dovetail very quickly. I think people seeing it yesterday, today, uh, and tomorrow are going to really hurt those Saturday, Sunday numbers. So expect Magic Mike XXL, I believe, to be the number one movie of the weekend. All right, so on to the viewer question. This came from, where did it go? Ah, I, I must have accidentally deleted it. Uh, it's LeVar Alexander, I believe. Let me see if I have it pasted. Nope, oh, sorry. All right, uh, Laxel Alexander. I, oh, there it is. Lazar that's, um, I was not, I was kind of close. There it is. Lazar Avramovsky. Yesterday, Lazar Avramovsky, hello Lazar, said, are you going to cover the new Ghostbusters costumes and proton packs? And I have not covered them. So I guess I'm kind of technically covering them now, but I wanted to answer why I didn't. Well, I felt that uh, while I appreciate Paul Feig trying to be very social media savvy, I believe he pulled a bit of a David Ayer here and where he tweeted a non-story, right? Well, as you can see here are the pictures of the uh, costumes and the proton packs, and there really isn't anything to see, anything new. I mean, yep, that's a Ghostbuster uniform. Yep, that's a proton pack. I mean, it's not like they're pink or anything, right? Thank goodness. Uh, but I don't think that they're really noteworthy. Uh, you know, I think if he tweeted someone wearing it, it would have been gone viral and been huge, but perhaps that would have been too much of a giveaway. Although, is he going to shoot any exteriors with them? If so, he better clear a very 
wide radius uh, in terms of the general public if he doesn't want that stuff showing up online. Uh, and I'm sure if someone were to show up online, I definitely would cover it because that would be news. So what I wanted to ask you today, and that's Lazar, why I didn't cover it. I just felt that, you know, I try to make sure that when I put a video up, you can feel safe. You can feel safe in the thought that there's actually something for me to say. You know, it's different doing video coverage than uh, print coverage, right? Print coverage just puts it up there and they say, hey, look at this, and they're done. But with video coverage, I kind of have to have something to say or else, you know, what's the point of the video? So it's a, it's a line that I try to adhere to. Uh, you know, it's a matter of integrity. I like to think so. Uh, and I hope that you agree with me because I'd hate for you, you know, when you see a video that I posted it, it's because I have something to say and there's something for us to discuss. So what we're going to discuss with now with this viewer question is, do you agree that filmmakers need to be a little bit more savvy and careful with what they tweet out as far as reveals go. Do you think that when you see this Ghostbuster costume and proton pack, are you like, oh boy, thanks Paul Feig, or you're like, yeah, whatever. And you know, and also the same with David Ayer. Do you believe that there's such a thing as bad tweeting and social media coverage for a film? Or do you think anything the filmmaker's willing to share with us is great? I guess you don't want to discourage them from sharing, but they should put a little more thought into their shares. And especially because Ghostbusters, this reboot, got off to such a good start uh, with him showing off the, the slime. I thought that was a great, uh, a great uh, uh, Instagram or tweet that he sent out there. I thought that was really good. Another good social media recent tweet was Kevin Feige with that uh, piece of artwork congratulating Jurassic World for breaking Avengers record. That was very cool as well. That's, I think, what you want to do. You want to do something special and noteworthy if you really want people to pay attention to it. So, Lazar, thank you so much for asking, and I definitely am keeping an eye on Ghostbusters 2016 uh, movie news as it develops, and we'll definitely be covering it when I think there's something for us to discuss. All right, thank you everybody for tuning in. That's today's more movie news, please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.